Shalom. Uh, welcome. I'm Rabbi Scott with Beth Yeshua Messianic Synagogue in Fort Myers, Florida. We are reissuing the Revelation series that was taught by Rabbi Jim Pickens here at Beth Yeshua over the course of the last two years or so. We feel these messages are especially relevant in these tumultuous times, and we hope and pray that Adonai uses them uh, to strengthen you uh, and, and to encourage you. If you are currently a supporter of this ministry, we would like to say thank you. We appreciate your partnership with us as we all labor together in the work of the gospel of Yeshua uh, in the kingdom here on earth. Uh, if you would like to support us, you will find a link uh, below in uh, the video description. Once again, uh, we hope uh, that this is a blessing to you. If you have any questions, you will find an email address. Uh, if you have any dialogue or discussion, you'll find an email address in the video description below. Please reach out to us. We'd love to hear from you. And uh, now uh, I will give you the Revelation series with Rabbi Jim Pickens. Shalom. Well, we're back to studying the Olivet Discourse. Last time um, we didn't get very far, essentially two verses out of Matthew, Matthew 24, 15, and 16. Tonight, I promise to get you a little further, but before we leave Matthew 24, 15, and 16, just a little more. Just a little more. First of all, in Matthew 24 up through verse 14, Yeshua has been telling the Talmudim, the disciples, about the end of times. He's been answering their threefold question, which reads, one, when will the destruction of the temple occur? Two, what will be the sign of your coming? And three, what will be the sign of the end of the age? But Yeshua has been talking to them in generalities up to that point, uh, talking of things also global in nature instead of focusing directly in on Israel and Jerusalem. Then in verse 15, Yeshua starts to focus specifically on a particular event that will only occur in Israel, only occur in Judah, in Jerusalem, only on the Temple Mount. And Yeshua's focus narrows to when you see the abomination that causes devastation standing in the holy place. The other statement that was made was when you see this, flee to the mountains or escape to the hills, depending upon your translation. We looked at the 4th century Christian writer Eusebius of Caesarea last week and his claim that this had already happened and that the believers that were in Jerusalem had fled to the city of Pella, the city of Pella prior to the Roman destruction. We also looked at the fact that more recent scholars have discounted that because of what Yeshua said. What Yeshua said is, when you see this abomination that causes devastation or desolation standing in the holy place, then you are to flee. But in 70 of the common era, by the time the Romans brought their standards in that uh, were bearing the likeness of Caesar on them, by the time they brought those actually into the Temple Mount, Eusebius' claim of what was the abomination of devastation for his thesis was these standards bearing the likeness of Caesar. The time that they had brought them in, the time for fleeing had long since passed, and so none could escape. That had been two years prior that they needed to escape during a break in the siege of Jerusalem. But there was no likeness of Caesar in the holy place at that time, and only after that, it was when it was there, Rome was fully occupying the place, and it was too late to flee. This abomination that causes devastation most likely is a statue, a statue that will be erected in the holy place, and it still lies, I believe, in our future. So does having to flee to the hills or to the mountains. And since this is dealt with more as we push ahead in the next verses, we want to look at a little bit more at this fleeing to the hills slash mountains. 
Yeshua specifically says that those in Judah must flee to the hills. What's Yeshua talking about? Well, let's look at this again, but with some thoughts added that I'm going to quote from Bob Heiss and also from myself. When this occurs, and remember it's sometime in the future yet, where do those in Judah actually flee to? Where are those in Israel going to run off to? Do they just generally scatter into the hills? And I believe that is not so. There's a particular place, but we have to support that with Scripture, that they would go to what some call a city of refuge. So then, where would this city of refuge be? And who would be fleeing? All this is laid out for us in Scripture. So let's start by reading Zechariah chapter 13, uh, verses 8 and 9. It says, In time throughout the land, says Adonai, two-thirds of those in it will be destroyed. They will die, but one-third will remain. That third part I will bring through the fire. I will refine them as silver is refined. I will test them as gold is tested. They will call on my name and I will answer them. I will say, this is my people, and they will say, Adonai is my God. One of the thoughts that we have is that this one-third that remains after the two-thirds are destroyed is the actual remnant, those that are faithful to God, and that these are the ones who will ultimately have to take refuge from the thing that's coming. These are the ones who will flee to the mountains. They'll do so to escape the fate of the other two-thirds of the population, which never had an opportunity to flee. This speaks of the time of God's wrath that is being poured out. So then the question becomes, where do they flee to? So let's look in Revelation 12, verses 5 and 6, please. She, that is Israel, she gave birth to a son, a male child, the one who will rule all the nations with a staff of iron. But her child was snatched up to God and he's thrown. Pause there for a minute. That's talking about things that have already taken place. It took place during Yeshua's first ministry. Now in verse 6, we move ahead to the return, to the time of the second coming. And it says, And she, that's Israel again, fled into the desert where she has a place prepared by God so that she can be taken care of for the 1260 days. So this has moved ahead. That the, the pause there between verses 5 and 6 is moving us from first coming to just before the second coming of Messiah. 1260 days here speaks to three and a half years. The setting up of the abomination will take place at midpoint in the seven years of tribulation, which coincides, I believe, with this fleeing to the mountains. Now, this time frame works here. Look over on the next page, if you're reading your Bible at home, at Revelation 12:14, please. But the woman, that's Israel, was given two wings of great eagles, two wings of the great eagle, so that she could fly to her place in the desert where she is taken care of for a season and two seasons and half a season away from the serpent's presence. Now, the woman is Messianic Israel because I believe that's who's left and that one-third are those that call for Yeshua's return and accept him. The season, two seasons and a half a season adds out to be three and a half years. So. The woman here is the remnant, Messianic Israel. Those who have attached themselves to Messianic Israel, I believe, would be included in this group. And they are escaping the wrath. These could very well be references to the event of Matthew 24, 15, and 16, if I could have that, please. So when you see the abomination that causes devastation spoken about through the prophet Daniel standing in the holy place, let the reader understand the allusion. That will be the time for those in Judah to escape to the hills. So all of this is beginning to flow together, to fit together. Now the place where they're going to take, are going to flee, has to fulfill several requirements if we take these passages into consideration. 
We have to look at there being mountains, or at the very least, huge hills. Some translations render this each way. So one of the requirements is some place in the hills are mountains. The statements in Revelation 12 indicate that this hills or mountains will be in a desert place, which is essential, essentially a dry, barren region, a wilderness in that part of the world. And Revelation seems to indicate that it will be prepared to receive all of these people in advance. Reason for that is you couldn't take that amount of people to a place in the desert unless it's ready. It has to be prepared for them to be there. Even though there's more, for easy math's sake, let's just say that this occurrence, there are six million Jews going to be in Israel. One third of that would be two million people. Well, you just can't dump two million mostly citified people into a barren wilderness. This would be made up to a great degree of people who are accountants, physicists, housewives, house husbands, rabbis. Unless you've got something prepared for them, they can't survive. See, this is a Jewish group. Most of them couldn't even build a sukkah if it didn't come in a kit form, a really simple kit at that. Two million people would not be able to survive long in these circumstances, fleeing from the takeover of the false messiah with nothing but their shirts on their backs into a barren wilderness without being taken care of, which God says he's going to do. God tells us in many places he's going to take care of us at this time. So where do we think this place is? Well, let's look in Micah. Chapter 2, verse 12. I will assemble you, Jacob. I will gather the remnant of Israel. I will put them together like sheep in a pen, like a herd in its pasture. It will hum with the sounds of people. Well, yeah, because there's going to be too many, two million people talking. That'll be a little bit on the loud side. Note that word remnant. Now then, Notice the phrase at the end of the next line, which says, like sheep in a pen. What we're interested in looking at closely is that little short phrase, in a pen. That's a major clue as to what the location is going to be that this is going to take place. This term, in a pen, in the Hebrew, is from the word basra. This word, this term, in a pen, in the Hebrew, is from the word, in the Hebrew, Basra. Just about everybody's translation renders Basra here as in a pen. Just one translation, the 1901 American Standard Edition, actually inserts the word Basra. If we look it up, Basra, we find that Basra occurs nine times throughout the Old Testament. Look in a Hebrew dictionary and we'll find two meanings. It can mean a sheep pen, or it can be a proper noun indicating a place. Now, what makes this really interesting is that every place where Basra is used except one, it's a proper name and a specified place. But here it's telling us of a sheep pen. Well, that works because the remnant, the sheep, are going to be in a place where it can be taken care of in these mountains or hills in the wilderness, in the desert. They're not just going to be running around loose. So where is this place, Basra, located? Is it in the mountain range? Yeah. What mountain range? Well, Basra, we know from geography, is in the mountain range of Mount Seir. Mount Seir. S-E-I-R is the way I spell it in English. The range of Mount Seir is located on the east side of the Rift Valley that also holds the Sea of Galilee, the Jordan River, and the Dead Sea. And this mountain range of Mount Seir extends from the southern end of the Dead Sea southward to the Gulf of Aquaba. It is, in essence, the ancient kingdom of Edom. Edom is Esau. Edom's also the modern Arabs. Esau is also the modern Arabs. But by this time, 
Israel's remnant escaping by this time that they're leaving, God's telling them to get out of Dodge, that area will be vacant. That area will be vacant. If we study Obadiah, we find that, one, none of the house of Esau survives in this. And two, also in that area is a place called Petra. Petra. And I think most of us have heard of Petra. It's been on TV. It's been in National Geographic. It's a place where you have to either walk in or go in by horse and donkey. And its narrow canyon trail opens up into a city carved out of the rock hills. It's a natural fortress back in there. Understand, I don't think there's any way to get two million people into this place, but that's the general area that we're talking about, Basra being located in. Basra, which will be the sheep pen. Now the sheep, who are those that follow after the Good Shepherd, there's a present Arab village called Busaria, Busaria in, located there, which seems to retain the name Basra, a modernized version of the name Basra. This region is a mountainous wilderness. It's a barren place. This is one of those places in Scripture, in my opinion, where there can be a double meaning and both right. Basra can be the sheep pen. It can also be the location specifically of where this sheep pen is going to be located. It's a proper noun indicating the actual place, but it can also mean the place where Yeshua, the good shepherd, will place his sheep for safety, the sheep pen. Regardless of where we try to pinpoint the location to, and that's a failing of man, we always try to be too exact, there's little doubt that the area of Mount Seir is where it's going to be. Now with that in mind, let's go to Daniel 11:41, please. He will also enter the land of glory, and many countries will come to grief, but these will be saved from his power. Edom, Moab, and the people of Ammon. He here is speaking of the false messiah. The false messiah will also enter the land of glory, and many countries will come to grief, but these will be saved from the power of the false messiah. Edom, Moab, and the people of Ammon. This area now really mostly comprises the modern state of Jordan. Ammon is the capital of modern Jordan. What's interesting here is that the false messiah will essentially conquer the whole world. But the area of these three ancient nations just across the Great Rift Valley will escape his power will be saved from his power. He's going to march all over, a mighty conqueror, and Scripture takes the time to point out in one little statement this area is going to be saved from his, him, saved from his power. The area in modern Jordan in which was Edom, the Esau's kingdom, Edom extended down to the Gulf of Aquaba. Above Edom was Moab, and above Moab was Ammon. So that literally geographically lays out that area for us to understand exactly where it is on a map. And in that area, in the desert mountains, the ancient city of Basra, in the political system in place in the world of that coming time, where would be the only place in the world where Messianic Jews would be safe? The place that God says is to be set aside from the power of the false Messiah. When the plagues come against Egypt, or when the plagues came against Egypt, I should say, Israel was safe in Goshen. It's a pre-picture of this coming event in our world. Israel was safe in Goshen, a place where they were separated from all of Egypt a place where the serious plagues didn't fall. When God's wrath is poured out on the world, 
That's what Daniel 11.41 is telling us. Now, that was some background for really better understanding the following verses in Matthew that we're going to look at. I think this information gives us a basis for more impact from what we're going to look at in these next verses. So let's go to Matthew 24, 17, please. If someone is on the roof, he must not go down to gather his belongings from his house. If someone is in the field, he must not go back to get his coat. What a terrible time it will be for a pregnant woman and nursing mothers. Verse 20, verse 20 is to me fascinating. Pray that you will not have to escape in the winter or on Shabbat. We're going to deal with that a little bit of depth here in a minute. Four verses here. We've already doubled what we looked at last week just in this one passage. Four verses here. This is, frankly, I believe, an extraordinary statement. Let's compare it, though, with Mark 13, 15, please. If someone is on the roof, he must not go down and enter his house to take any of his belongings. If someone is in the field, he must not turn back to get his coat what a terrible time it will be for pregnant women and nursing mothers. Pray that it may not happen in the winter. There's a number of things to look at. If we interpret this literally, and the general rule is to interpret literally unless it just can't be interpreted that way, Yeshua is saying here that when the abomination that causes desolation appears, the messianic remnant should flee. When that event occurs, all of Yeshua's people really should flee, must flee. And right then, with no hesitation involved, they have to flee. There's an urgency about this. Don't go back inside to pick up a coat. Don't hesitate about anything. If you're on the roof, don't go down to pick anything up. Just boogie on out of there. If you're working in a field, don't take time to go get any possessions. Take off. So think about this. These people this is talking about are in Judah, in modern Israel. The abomination is being set up in the holy place of the temple. Is this setting up of the abomination being done in secret, hidden from view? I think probably yes, because the holy place is actually physically inside the temple. Those doors could be closed. There's the holy place, the double curtains, and then the most holy place. So they could be setting this up in there. And if it's being set up in there, it's not probably a humongous big statue. I would think maybe no more than maybe the height of this room here that we're in right now. So is it being done in secret? Could be. Or does it happen suddenly, like maybe flown in by a helicopter and they open the doors and set it up and bang, it's there just like that, put together someplace else. Anyhow, there comes an announcement that this is here and what it's all about. And that's when everybody is supposed to flee, is when they get this word. And it evidently catches the people by surprise when it's revealed. So, think about this. Does this word that the abomination that causes devastation is set up in the holy place come in by TV or radio? Yeah, I think so. I think this is broadcast worldwide by the false messiah because he's stopping temple worship and setting himself up to be God and to be worshipped, and this idol is to be worshipped in his absence. So, Everyone's seeming to get the word about it at the same time. And that affects people in really two different settings if we just deal with Israel itself. One would be urban, living in the major cities, and the other would be rural. And they get the word at the same time, so it has to come from a source that would be available to everybody. And in this day and age, radio and TV is available to everybody. And the word is from Messiah, Yeshua, when you see this, when this is announced to you, when it becomes available to you, run for the hills. Run for the hills. Run for the hills to that place that the false Messiah will not be able to control because God has set it aside for his personal use for his people. Next, Yeshua has concern for women 
who by their circumstances have a disadvantage in fleeing in a hurry because they may either be pregnant or they might be nursing children. So this potentially would be a terrible time for them, but not impossible. We really need to think about this. First of all, this event of the abomination that causes desolation is going to happen. It's cut in stone. It's going to happen. It will stand in the holy place of a future temple at some point. Yeshua has said so. What's then interesting is the time that this fleeing will happen is subject to prayer. Think about that. What's interesting is the time that this fleeing will happen is subject to prayer, and I believe that's fascinating. Think of how many people that claim to be part of the body of Messiah that never bother to pray. So there's going to be just a select group, I believe, that really are intently praying. Too many people in the body of Messiah almost never pray, don't know how to pray. Some of them don't even believe that their prayer amounts to anything. And here Yeshua is saying to us that our prayer can control which season of the year this is going to occur in. Pray that this doesn't happen in the wintertime. The same thing applies to the day of the week. Pray that this doesn't happen on Shabbat. It's interesting to note from that statement, pray that this doesn't happen on Shabbat, that it appears that this might just be a one-day event. It's talking about happening quickly. Everything is being rushed. Everybody has to hustle. This is something that's going to happen suddenly and must be reacted to very, very quickly. And we will have the powers, this is speaking of about believers, this is speaking to this remnant of the faithful at that time, we will have the power which has been delegated to us in this matter to modify future history. Not change it, but modify it so that the tremendous effects will not come on us with the force they came upon all of the others. Think about this. It's going to happen within the period of some given year. But we've been delegated the authority that through our prayer we can keep it from happening in the wintertime or on Shabbat. Think about this. There is still that specific day that is Shabbat, and it is, I believe, of paramount importance during this event. Pray that it doesn't happen on Shabbat. God's not going to change the event, but our prayer can influence him in designating when it will occur. Designating that will give his people a maximum chance of survival, because everyone must leave out of Jerusalem and, and Israel, head for the mountains with essentially the shirt on their back. Don't take time to go back and pick up your cloak or coat. Pray this doesn't happen in the wintertime. Fleeing to the barren mountain, desert mountains in the wintertime without a coat wouldn't be a good deal, particularly for a pregnant woman or a nursing mother with an infant in her arms. So God says, pray it doesn't happen in the wintertime. And I believe we should pray in earnest for this. Go to James, chapter 5, verse 16. It says, Therefore openly acknowledge your sins to one another and pray for each other so that you may be healed. What we really want to focus on here, though, is that final statement. The prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. See, those that are going to be leaving going out to the area of the land that's set aside for them to be in by God are going to be righteous people. And the prayer of a righteous person is powerful and effective. The idea that God will modify the situation such that the messianic escape won't be in the winter will be largely under the influence of the righteous persons, the righteous people that will be praying, that will be involved in this. But why not the Shabbat? Why not the Shabbat? What, what it, is, it is saying here is that this is going to occur in a system or in a society 
that frankly prohi has prohibitions of doing things concerning the Shabbat. So think about this carefully. This is going to happen in Jerusalem, in Judah, in Israel. Three and a half years into renewed temple worship. Temple worship is being going to be done. Who was going to be running the temple worship in the temple at this time? Assume that it will be the Orthodox. The Orthodox will be pretty much in control of the temple. And particularly, they'll be in control of what's allowed on Shabbat. And they have prohibitions about Shabbat, things that you can't do on Shabbat, such as driving cars is prohibited. Public transportation on Shabbat shouldn't be even running down the street. If one has to flee on that day of Shabbat, it would be very difficult. Even today, if you drive your car into an Orthodox area on Shabbat, you risk stoning, literally. Walking is reduced to more than a tad over a half mile among the Orthodox today, and they're the people who up until this false Messiah reveals the abomination that causes desolation, have been in control of running the temple, which basically puts them in control of what's going on among the Jewish people. So then, we also get an idea from the text here that the kind of social system that this is going to happen under, these words concerning Shabbat here would have no bearing on anything happening in a non-Jewish, non-Orthodox society. Really wouldn't matter. But if society was pagan, which the event of the abomination of desolation being presented is going to cause, going to transition Israel into on that day by taking away their worship of God and putting in place their worship of the false Messiah and his idol, prohibited by God, then, fleeing on the Sabbath for those who are not Orthodox, who are not religious in this, would really become no different than fleeing on any other day of the week. Because in the most of the world, heaven forbid you even shut down a Walmart on Shabbat. A non-Orthodox society. But, until this happens, these words only have meaning in a society that has a Sabbath. And the system of rules and regulations leading to that Sabbath will control a lot of things that people will be able to do in making this escape. They're going to have to run for it. One other important thing that we should understand, any of these Jewish regulations, such as those concerning the Sabbath, can be suspended if that suspension of them is to preserve your life. And this has really been in, in, in place for thousands of years. And what this tells us is that the religious system in effect at that time will not give any credibility to the words of Yeshua. Because Yeshua says you can suspend the regulations of the Sabbath to preserve your life. The rules concerning the Shabbat will not be suspended just because a statue of the false Messiah is set up in the holy place. They probably won't gather a clue that they're no longer controlling the temple. But particularly, not suspended because Yeshua has said, and remember, we don't believe, if we're in the Jewish community out there, we don't believe anything about him. It won't be suspended because he has said, when you see this, run for your life. The rules of Judaism in that place will not be messianic. Pray that this will not occur on a Shabbat. Matthew 24, 21 and 22, please. For there will be trouble then worse than there has ever been from the beginning of the world until now, and there will be nothing like it again. Indeed, if the length of this time had not been limited, no one would survive. But for the sake of those who have been chosen, its length will be limited. For the sake of the chosen, its length will be limited. Mark 13, 19. For there will be worse trouble at that time than there has ever been from the very beginning when God created the universe until now. 
and there will be nothing like it again. Indeed, if God had not limited the duration of the trouble, no one would survive. But for the sake of the elect, those whom he has chosen, he has limited it. So this group that's on boogieing out of Israel, out of the grasp of the false Messiah into the set-aside area of God now, are the elect, they're the chosen, and this that's going to befall the world as a whole is limited because of them, so that they too can survive. That seems to indicate that there's going to be perhaps things that will overflow into that area he has set aside, such as perhaps radiation poisoning, things that are not limited to just borders. Here then, in these two passages of Matthew 24 and Luke 13, we start to discuss the great distress that's going to be triggered by the abomination that causes devastation being in the holy place. What follows as indicated, is the period of great distress. And it's interesting that Josephus uses almost identical language in discussing the destruction of Jerusalem. Now, I'm going to stick with Adonai. Something is added by Adonai. So let's go to Daniel 12.1 to see what this is that he adds says, when that time comes, well, that time comes is what we're talking about right now. When that time comes, Michael, Michael, the great prince of cha who champions your people, will stand up and there will be a time of distress unparalleled between the time they became a nation and that moment. See how this is all fitting into what has just been said? At that time, your people will be delivered everyone whose name is found written in the book. This is again speaking to those that are the chosen. I believe this is inter indicating the time that the righteous remnant we've been talking about are going to be in the process of leaving and Michael the archangel is going to appear. The trigger of the abomination of devastation being set up in the holy place is really going to take place only when allowed by Adonai, hopefully influenced by our prayer. And it is what also causes him to release Michael, to have him stand up to be with us as what ushers in this time is the period of unparalleled distress. See, God's taken care of his people. We had some discussion last week about God taking care of his people. This is telling us how God's going to take care of his people. This is the event that Yeshua is speaking of in Matthew 25, 19, and 20. What is being spoken of here, unparalleled distress has not yet occurred. And to that I say, really, what about Noah? That was a little distressful. That speaks to a time of pretty huge distress being brought on the world. The whole world was flooded and everybody wiped out except the one that was the select of God, Noah and his family. What happened at the time of Noah was God's wrath against man. Note that. God's wrath against man is the only thing that's involved there. Here we're looking at something that's a little bit different. Yeah, I believe totally different because what is coming is essentially man's wrath against man. Influenced by Satan, but it's essentially man's wrath against man. That's what's going to be happening when the false messiah, a man, takes over in Jerusalem and brings things to bear against God's people. It says enormous carnage is going to be involved. Already we hear a lot about the proliferation of weapons of mass destruction, of nukes falling into the hands of terrorists. Some dismiss this as a rumor. Others seem pretty sure of it. Already Israel is involved in a war in Gaza against terrorists whose religion is shared by over a billion, two hundred million people. And they have rockets. 
they have 65,000 armed troops. See, a significant number of these areas that we're looking at around Israel, the Golan Heights, the area just above them in Lebanon. See, a significant number of these people, of this billion, 200 million people, have already reduced this to the fact that it's a holy war. It's a war between our God and the God of Israel. God indicates that two-thirds of Israel living in the land are going to die in this wrath of man against man. When we get into Revelation, we'll also look at worldwide numbers that are going to be taking place that are frankly extremely dramatic. But look at what Yeshua is saying here. The length of this time will be limited. We don't know how long that's going to be, but essentially if these days were not cut short, no one would survive. So our Messiah promises that this time is going to be limited. This translates into, though, this taking place on a global basis, but again, for the sake of those that have been chosen, these days are going to be cut short. Now, if we go back into Daniel, it would seem that this time Yeshua is talking about would be described for us. I think it's described for us in Daniel 11.44. However, news from the east and the north will frighten him, that's the false Messiah, so that he moves out in great fury to ruin and completely do away with many. See, this is going to be the annihilation of the population of the world that's in disagreement with him. The him and the he here, obviously speaking of the false Messiah, who is really the perpetrator of these events, has stated here. This is probably what's being talked about by Yeshua in Matthew 24, 21, and 22. When this annihilation of many people will occur, this is talking about the time the false Messiah moves. Now, these days are cut short for the sake of the chosen, and the word chosen here refers to believers. I think it makes no distinction between Jews and Gentiles believers. But it certainly refers to Jews here in this passage because these passages are wholly focused on Israel. This passage is focusing on the remnant. But we are also talking about something going on here that's global in nature, encompassing the population of the world. And I think this is borne out for us by Ephesians chapter 1 verses 4 and 5, please. In the Messiah... He chose us in love before the creation of the universe to be holy and without defect in His presence. That's God. In the Messiah, He chose us in love before the creation of the universe to be holy and without defect in His presence. That's those of us that are the chosen. Verse 5, He determined, that's God, He determined in advance that through Yeshua the Messiah, we would be His sons in keeping with His pleasure and purpose. For lack of a better term, what we're talking about here is really being a spiritual elect. This defines the word chosen, the chosen ones. We are the spiritual elect. In Messiah, He chose us. If it wasn't for the sake of the chosen, no one would survive. Now, the rising in Daniel 21, 1 of Michael is part of the cutting short of these days. It's very possible that these days would be longer if Michael didn't come and interfere in the course of man. What's emphasized here by Yeshua is the extraordinary carnage of the period. So let's continue with Matthew 24 with verses 23 and 25. At that time, if someone says to you, look, here's the Messiah, or there he is, don't believe him. For there will appear false messiahs and false prophets performing great miracles, amazing things, so as to fool the chosen, if possible. Hang on to that. We're going to look at that in some depth. There I have told you in advance. Wow. Mark chapter 13, please. 21. At that time, if anyone says to you, look, here's the Messiah, or see, there he is, don't believe him, there will appear false messiahs and false prophets performing signs and wonders for the purpose, if possible, of misleading the chosen. But you 
Watch out. I have told you everything in advance. This reference to false messiahs certainly was fulfilled in the times just prior to and right after the fall of Jerusalem with the destruction of the temple in the year 70. But the context here also looks to the end of the age and that there will be those that falsely claim that the Messiah has arrived. The deceit will have two main forms. One, those who pretend to be the Messiah. And two, those who say this or that other person is the Messiah. So there'll be those claiming to be that and those that'll be announcing that person throughout the world. This time will also contain false prophets and false messiahs who perform or display mighty signs. These would be supernatural feats that point away from the performers, that would be the false prophets, to the enabler, that would be the false messiah, and both the false prophets and the false messiah are going to be empowered by Satan, by Hasatan. Wonders or marvels are also part of this definition. That probably refers to the same extraordinary performances viewed from the aspect of their unusual character and especially their effect on those who observe them and are taken in by these individuals. Signs and wonders will be so convincing and the deceivers so intense, they will try to deceive to make wander away from Messiah, even the chosen, if possible. Now the implication here in that term, if possible, is to make the deception of the chosen a contradiction of terms. It's to make the deception, potential deception, I guess I should say, of the chosen a contradiction of terms. What is really saying here those of us that are true believers will see these signs and wonders for what they really are. We'll see them as counterfeits. That's what this whole warning is all about for the faithful. It won't be possible to fool us. But if we go anywhere, to the next door neighbor perhaps, to any place, the ones of shallow faith will be fooled. And the unbelievers will be totally taken in. And if we try to tell these people that they're being misled, that what they're seeing is not the truth, we'll be doing that at our own peril because they're gonna believe that we're trying to put down the actual Messiah returned. That's how convincing it's gonna be. That's what Yeshua is saying here. It will be so convincing that even the chosen will not be, but could be fooled by it. That's how convincing. But we won't be fooled by that because it says, if that were possible. But it isn't possible because we have the indwelling of the Holy Spirit, which will guard and protect us and teach us. So if it's so good as to potentially fool even the chosen, those of shallow faith and the unbelievers will absolutely, I believe, be taken in. In verses um, 25 in Matthew and 28 in Mark, literally means what it says. There I have told you in advance. There I have told you in advance. This is going to happen. You have been warned about it. This is meant to, meant to really strengthen Yeshua's Talmudim, his faithful. In fact, all of those that follow him and really strengthen, prepare us. When the time comes, we'll not say how strange, how unexpected. We'll have been prepared for it. It will strengthen and confirm our faith when we see these things coming into being. It's happening like it's supposed to happen is going to be our thinking. And of course, we know that at the end of the book, we win. Then, let's look in Matthew 24, 26. If people say to you, listen, he's out in the desert, don't go. Or look, he's hidden away in a secret room, don't believe it. For when the Son of Man does come, it will be like lightning that flashes out of the east and fills the sky into the western horizon. Wherever there's a dead body, that's where you will find the vultures. Boy, does that change with that verse. 
Verse 26 indicates the type and form the deceit will take regarding the false messiahs. Notice that they, the false messiahs, will always be someplace not generally acceptable. Out in the desert, in a secret room, someplace it's difficult to, for us to check out. That will cause those that are deceived to be deceived by an act of their own faith, that they're believing in something that's wrong. See, this, this whole business of the false messiahs being someplace generally not acceptable is like the aliens in the Nat National Enquirer. The aliens that show up in the National Enquirer are always in Tibet or someplace like that, and everywhere you can get to them easily to verify what's being said. These stories of false messiahs will have the same content as the National Enquirer's aliens, Yeshua says, don't believe it. Verse 27 tells us that the second coming will be nothing mysterious. Verse 27 tells us that the second coming will be nothing mysterious. When the Son of Man does come, will be like lightning flashing out of the east and filling the sky to the western horizon. Nothing mysterious about that. Lightning lighting up the whole sky. It will be fully disclosed out there for everybody to see spontaneous across the whole globe. There will be no need for faith observance in something remote and hidden. It's going to be all out in the open, a historical, observable fact before everybody's eyes like a flash of lightning. In verse 28, Yeshua quotes an ancient proverb. If you've studied this, you know that it can have many meanings depending upon context. It's, it's like an idiomatic phrase of its day. It's saying like, Wherever you have certain conditions existing, the normal or natural effect or consequence of these conditions will be present. Where there's a dead body, you'll find the vultures. That's normal for those conditions. If you had a dead body, that's where the vultures will gather. Whenever certain happenings exist, whenever certain happenings exist, the natural consequences of these happenings will occur. In the context of the proverb here, the coming of Messiah will involve certain conditions and happenings. When these conditions and happenings occur, the natural result of them will be the coming or return of Messiah. Just that simple. I'm going to leave you with a thought that Stern gives us in his Jewish New Testament commentary, which says, quote, birds preying on Karen seems to refer to persons used by demonic spirits to carry out evil purposes. In other words, these vultures are the equivalent to persons carrying out demonic purposes, and they gather around the false messiahs to draw the people away from truth. All right, that concludes what we have for tonight. Now, I bet you didn't think we'd get this far after last week's but we did. We're going to start in Matthew 24, 29, next study. There's just that and two more after that, three more studies, and then we'll start on the book of Revelation itself.